welcome you um, to this uh, morning meeting at ORF, and we are delighted to welcome uh, Simeon Yankov and uh, Junaid Ahmed, um, two very special guests, very talented people working on a number of very important uh, issues uh, around development, human capital, and of course, uh, the topic for today, the future of work, and how it uh, links up with uh, the, the key question of how we invest in people. Um, this is, uh, in many ways, also a good time for ORF because just uh, this month we have launched our Future of Work initiative, uh, which is being led by my colleague Terry, who's somewhere there. Yeah, I can see her. Uh, she's leading our work on the Future of Work. And uh, I was uh, uh, briefing Simeon that we are focusing on three important aspects of the Future of Work. One is paychecks and how do we ensure that we move up the value chain in terms of how people are uh, made more productive, how they are able to realize more value for the time, and how they are able to tap into more opportunities, uh, both globally and locally. Uh, the second, of course, uh, we are focusing on is protection, and how do you uh, replace the in situ protections that premises, factories, and, and formal establishments offered people? Uh, how does technology and uh, new innovative ways of offering social protections um, uh, play out? as we uh, look at the decade ahead. And finally, how do you give purpose to people who uh, don't have the collective aggregations of the past? How do you give them a sense of belonging, identity? Uh, how do you integrate them into key uh, uh, social groupings and, and, and uh, make them participate in, in, in many uh, community tasks? And in that sense, uh, these are the three big uh, pillars we are looking at. And of course, hopefully, at the end of one year, we will come up with some form of a um, uh, a draft that would uh, suggest some new ideas on the social contract, which essentially will need to be renegotiated as we uh, move to this new phase of uh, evolution in the 21st century. Um, uh, let me quickly introduce uh, the two speakers, and we will begin with Junaid, who will say a few words uh, and introduce uh, this particular project. And then uh, we will have Simeon give the uh, key presentation this morning. Uh, Simeon, of course, uh, is the director of the World Development uh, uh, Report 2019. He was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance of Bulgaria from 2009 to 2013. Uh, he is a doctorate in economics from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And uh, uh, I, if I was to read his CV, it will take the whole morning. Uh, but Simeon uh, is someone you should uh, uh, look out for. He has written interesting papers. I have a paper he's written on automation and innovation forces shaping the, the future of work. It's a good paper to download and read. Uh, in, very interesting read. Um, and he's going to be speaking to us on uh, the theme this morning. We have Junaid uh, Ahmed, who's the director of the World Bank in India. And uh, he was a chief of staff to President Jim Yong Kim. Um, and uh, of course, he's since 1991 uh, served the bank in various capacities. And uh, he, uh, his personal, I am told his personal passion is human spaces, cities, uh, the urban uh, development and urban politics. And we look forward to hearing from both of you. So Junaid, can I first turn it over to you? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, warm welcome. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples uh, and talk about a few uh, few of the the projects we're working on, and then I'll have a punchline of how it links up to my uh, colleague uh, Simeon and and the work that he's going to be presenting. So let me share with you these examples. Uh, the other day, uh, I was uh, in Lajpat Nagar area and went to see a, uh, st a state partnership school. So basically, it's a school. Uh, that uh, began to lose its students uh, over the last few years. Uh, and it's a school that caters to, uh, uh, to the children of uh, lower, lower uh, income group. So this is the, the son of a bus conductor, the daughter of a security guard, uh, the, the daughter of a cook, uh, a public school uh, run by uh, Delhi Corpor Corporation. And over time, you began to see a movement of students out of this school into private schools. Uh, parents that were borrowing money to send uh, these children to private schools. Uh, a group, uh, uh, people, uh, organization, as in the people uh, tree, uh, basically entered into a partnership with the Delhi Corporation. And the partnership was simply this, uh, give us the land, 
give us your school infrastructure, give us your teachers, and we will invest in this school, and let's see what we can do. Uh, within three years, a uh, school that had, uh, and they took up three schools, had about nine students. Within three years, they have now over 400 students. Uh, two, these students, uh, many of whom had never actually been within the schooling system, are taking, uh, taking exams and doing extremely well. Three, the, the parents, when you meet them, extraordinary uh, in terms of how motivated they are of sending their, their children back to public schools, right? This is, this is extraordinary. And what happens inside this school is you have a completely different governance structure of how the principal works and how the teachers work. Uh, and there's a partnership between government teachers and the teachers that are brought in by the partner uh, organization. Now, uh, we had a round table of some of the uh, uh, best experts worldwide on charter schools in the US uh, and in Europe. And uh, one gentleman uh, who is, is the leading thinker on charter schools came in and he tells us the following story. He was a journalist. He said he walked around New York City into the uh, inner city schools. And what's, uh, what's uh, fascinating, he says, block after block, I began to see dilapidated public school structures with maybe 10 students, but all the teachers there. Exactly the same story that we're seeing, uh, uh, seeing in, in Delhi. And there he begins a whole program of entering into partnership with the New York municipality uh, and turning the, turning the schools around. These are, these are what I would call state partnerships. These are not what I would call private schools. Now, what is interesting is today, we're working with the uh, government of India not to look at primary and secondary school as a public school engagement, but for them to look at public schools, state partnership schools, and private schools as a system, and beginning to see how can you actually leverage this in order to create this kind of a governance systems across the spectrum. Right? So it's not private versus public, but you're trying to really leverage the system. So that's, that's one example. Um, let me give you another example. S significant investment in early childhood. Uh, Anganwadis, very, very important. Reaching out uh, to the, the child that is born, but the child being born even before the birth takes place. Uh, the, the support to the mother support to the child coming, uh, being born, the nutrition, but also the issues of, uh, uh, of the care that must happen between the mother and, and child, the stimulation that's needed to really get the brain functions moving, uh, even within the first thousand days of birth, uh, and how, these, uh, uh, how this early childhood uh, program really works. And second, looking at pre-kindergarten connection to kindergarten and the primary school, not to have these things separate. So you have the health ministry delivering uh, a early childhood program, but not linked to the schooling system. So we're now beginning to bring, bring the two together with, with government of India. I'll give you a third example. A third example, uh, significant partnership with government of India on the skilling ministry. And uh, what the skilling ministry is doing is it's set up a program in which they're looking at data at the district level and understanding how businesses are changing, how enterprises are changing at the, uh, uh, at the district level and asking how can you get a program of skill development through the private sector into uh, anticipating and providing, providing the skills, uh, skills that you need. The other area we're working, working with the skills ministry is how do you make schooling now seamlessly part of a skilling process. Not you finish schooling, then you go out to get a job, but constantly getting students to move in and out of schooling around skilling so that you're well prepared for, uh, uh, for the jobs, jobs market. And the final example I'll give you uh, is we're working uh, to really look at why is it that the Indian firms uh, are below their optimal size? Why do Indian uh, firms start off, enterprises start off small and remain small? 
Uh, and this issue of economic size is very important because if you want to break into export markets, you have to have a certain size. Now, if you take all of these together from Government of India's perspective, uh, early childhood, schooling, primary and secondary, and moving their governance system, skilling, uh, and the economic size, all of this is about how do you get the future jobs uh, uh, mark, how do you get how do you get the future job market being vibrant, and how do you get your your uh, citizens ready for that job market? Uh, well, now we know that the challenge is no longer in coming in really taking a policy positions on this. The challenge is implementation. How do you get a union government, state government, and local government well coordinated in the delivery of these services? Uh, this is the key challenge. The challenge is not is early childhood important for government of India? Is skilling important for government of India? Uh, these are policy decisions already taken. So it's a challenge of implementation. Now, the reason I, I raise these points is government of India and India as a whole clearly has started a huge investment in human capital. Uh, because there is an anticipation that unless India shifts its uh, compass on the outcomes of human capital, the citizens of India will not be ready for the type of job market that is that is coming in. Uh, Surjit Bhalla is here, and, and his work on human capital uh, has made a very strong point that if you look at the history of economic growth, it is in human capital that you see the real, real gains. So is India going to be ready for the future really depends on how India delivers on these programs. And this is something extremely important uh, for us in, from the World Bank to be in partnership. So from that perspective, Simeon is now going to talk to you about the work that uh, is being done uh, at the bank on the whole issue uh, of uh, the changing nature of work and, uh, and human capital. And you'll see that what's happening on the ground in terms of our operations and the thinking that's being brought in are very, very closely, closely correlated. But as you all will recognize, for governments like India, and including mine in Bangladesh, it is the delivery on the ground. It's the governance of delivery on the ground that will matter. Uh, and that's, a, that's an entirely different uh, uh, different uh, story, and I maybe will come back and we'll talk about that. But uh, within with that context, maybe I can ask my colleague uh, Simeon to, to come in. Simeon, it's all yours. Thank you very much um, for the invitation and for this um, uh, audience. Um, I should say that uh, when uh, I started work with my team on uh, this topic, the future of work, the changing <clears throat> nature of work, um, we quickly discovered that uh, the vast majority of writings and evidence uh, on this topic come from the United States. And then whatever doesn't come from the United States, uh, the remaining 5%, let's say, come from a few European countries like the United Kingdom. So a lot of what we know about this topic, it's a relatively new topic, comes from several advanced economies. And this is quite important for uh, some, of the, um, some of the findings that I will be sharing. And it's important for a specific reason, which I'll hope to convince you during this talk, which is that a lot of what we know about this topic is actually not true. Uh, or it's true for very few markets, the US, the UK um, uh, in particular. So we need to create a lot of new knowledge uh, in order to truly um, uh, answer the question, how is the um, uh, nature of work changing and what does this mean for the vast majority of people uh, around, uh, around the world? Um, before starting with some of our findings, let me mention that the World Development Report uh, most of you probably know, is the main annual publication of the World Bank. Uh, so the World Bank picks a big topic of importance to our clients in emerging markets uh, and then tries to put all the evidence that the World Bank group and uh, partners have. Uh, this year we decided, unlike previous years, to also change the nature of the WDR work and uh, rather than first going through our internal processes and uh, approval by our board and then publishing and only then presenting, 
we actually have put the report online, so it's updated every Friday with new comments. So if you give us comments within the next two weeks, we'll actually be able to implement these comments. Um, so if you just Google World Development Report 2019, you would see the latest uh, uh, publication. And in about two weeks, you can see also some of the changes, hopefully, from this, uh, from this uh, discussion. Um, uh, this, this process itself, in fact, is an example of, uh, of uh, the changing nature of, um, uh, of work, but it's also an example of some of the topics that I will uh, discuss uh, in this presentation, namely where I started, that a lot of the facts or the stylized facts that uh, the nascent literature on the future of work uh, gives us, in fact, are only correct for very few um, uh, countries, and I'll start with... Um, with that, so if you read, if you just uh, are new to this topic and start reading, um, uh, what is the future of work? Uh, in short, it's very bleak. Uh, so there are four stylized facts that are typically uh, typically presented in the at least in the English uh, uh, speaking literature. So the first fact says that technology adoption is much more much faster, basically much more rapid now than it has ever been in the past. So the pace with which technology is coming at us, and particularly at workers, is much faster than ever uh, uh, before. The second stylized fact is that manufacturing jobs are being lost uh, everywhere, particularly in advanced economy and economies and middle-income countries, but it's also a global phenomenon. So rapidly, there is a missing middle, uh, there is a polarization of poorly paid service jobs and very few high, uh, highly paid technological or finance jobs and nothing in the middle. Uh, and that there is a rise, the third fact of the gig economy where roughly speaking, people stay at home and work in their pajamas and they're not part of any large uh, uh, firms. They may be more flexible, but they also don't have the social protections that uh, working in um, large firms uh, uh, typically uh, gives you. So this is the third fact, the rise of the gig economy. And the last fact, which is related to the previous uh, two, is that as a result of uh, rapidly uh, diminishing number of manufacturing jobs and the rise of the gig, gig economy in most countries, inequality is rising very fast. Um, and, and hence a lot of social movements as well as political movements basically to say, let's stop this technological process, a bit like the Luddites uh, tried uh, uh, 150 years ago. Let's, uh, let's basically tax it differently. Let's tax robots. Even Bill Gates came up with this um, fairly idiotic idea and uh, let's uh, let's basically try to um, try to regulate uh, these new industries in different ways that it was done uh, uh, before so again much faster technological change manufacturing jobs being lost the gig economy is uh, becoming very prevalent and inequality is rising around the world in this report we try to just factually say, is this true and is it happening or is it not happening? And it turns out that none of these stylized facts, none of the four is actually true at the moment. So none of that is true outside of very few countries like the US. This is why I started with this discussion that if you just are new to this literature and read what's written, and then you think of your own country, Bangladesh or Bulgaria or India, just disregard the current literature. It actually will, um, will uh, at best confuse you at most, it would give you a very different picture from, um, from what is uh, uh, the picture in reality and also what are the issues in reality. So with this, uh, with this introduction, let me show you a few slides um, to perhaps how to think about this in the context of an emerging market um, and then what in our views are the real uh, issues. So I'll start with this uh, uh, picture. We have uh, in the first chapter of our report, we have a economic model. Just to make the point uh, is that uh, what the future of work is depends very much on which, from which country or even which sector you're looking at. Um, so this is a very simplified uh, model of what we are talking about, uh, where on the horizontal axis we have lined up sectors, first so-called old sectors and then the new sectors, basically by the level uh, by which they are affected by uh, automation. So if you think of, let's say, car parts, 
of a sector where a lot of robots have been coming in and have been taking over the sector. So that can be to the very beginning of the uh, of the horizontal axis. So what's happening in a, in a sector like car parts? Well, due to automation, you're losing a lot of employment. Uh, so above this uh, this um, orange line, basically, what's happening is that a large share of your employment in this uh, in this old sector is being uh, in being lost. And then you line up both manufacturing and service sectors, and in some you're losing a lot of employment due to automation, in others, less employment. This is basically the story of the United States and the UK. This is why they're worried about all the things that I mentioned, is because the prevailing uh, dynamic that is happening in this uh, uh, advanced economies um, is precisely that. So it is true that in the United States, manufacturing jobs are being uh, lost. Uh, in fact, over the last decade, about 15 million jobs have been uh, lost in the United States in the manufacturing sectors. Some of them, but very few, have moved to new sectors. So one of the um, analyses that we have is across the world, it's very difficult to move from an old sector to a new sector. So this concept of once you're mid-career, let's say, let's retrain you and move you to a new sector is basically nearly impossible to do. You need to worry about the new generation for getting into new sectors, and then you need to worry about a new social contract or basically social um, uh, protection for, uh, for current uh, workers. Uh, but the point of this graph is that if you are uh, the US or UK, you basically worry mostly about this first uh, box where you're losing uh, uh, jobs in uh, in old sectors. If you are uh, China or uh, Russia or I would argue India, you should be focused a lot more on the other box, the new, the new employment in new sectors due to, to innovation. So in other words, there are two forces. One is automation, which indeed reduces the labor force in old sectors, but the other one is innovation that creates completely new sectors and the possibility of um, of uh, more jobs. There is a secondary dynamic that is worth mentioning, uh, which is that most of the old jobs are in manufacturing and most of the new jobs are in what we call service sectors. But in the new economy, as I'll show you in a moment, in a way the two are very related uh, as well. So there is the, the line between manufacturing and, uh, and services is uh, gone. And we actually show in our report is that in many of the sectors that we call manufacturing, 60 to 80 percent of the content of the value added is actually services. Uh, so, so the future, if you like, uh, uh, that goes with innovation of economies like uh, China, like uh, uh, like India, most of the countries around the world, is actually a service sector uh, service sector model. But even much of manufacturing is moving towards uh, uh, more and more uh, services. Um, before starting to show you some uh, actual examples, let me uh, show you one more picture from, um, uh, from the model just to illustrate again, if you're in the US uh, or in the UK, uh, and I'll talk about uh, in a minute about other uh, advanced economies, basically you worry about this picture. So this picture, the orange line is if you like uh, the way that uh, things were before this latest uh, round of technology um, uh, existed, so um, relatively advanced economies before, because of their large markets, because of their um, access to better uh, technology, produce most of, um, most of the manufacturing goods in the, in the world and therefore employed a lot of workers. With globalization, basically a lot more of this production is moving to emerging economies, China mostly, but we, uh, we document in our report, Vietnam is actually becoming the next big manufacturing um, uh, powerhouse. Some of the poorer um, East Asian uh, uh, economies like Laos, for example, uh, are, are the next one. So globalization moves basically from advanced economies with high, higher wages to uh, to emerging economies. Automation, however, reduces altogether in these old sectors uh, employment. Think of it, uh, again, mostly as uh, manufacturing. So globally, you end up with less, uh, less employment in these uh, sectors. So if you just stop here, so if you're the, uh, the, in the US and you look at this, you say, OK, we're in trouble. And in some sense, the US actually is in trouble. 
because the remaining part of his workers indeed go to um, low paid, less protected services uh, jobs and basically get stuck, um, uh, stuck there. But my message again is that India, China, most of the world shouldn't worry about this picture. They should worry or we should worry about what are the opportunities due to, due to innovation that uh, we can benefit from. In some sense, if there is one picture worth remembering from this presentation, this is the picture. Um, with this report, uh, we've been asked many times, so you're telling me that it's not true that uh, technological uh, pace uh, is faster than before, and we can say, look, economists have documented and have worried about this going all the way back to Karl Marx, who worried uh, 150 years ago about uh, the pace of technological change. Keynes, about 100 years ago, predicted that in 1931, the technological change was fastest than ever and everybody will lose their jobs and so on. And that has not, uh, uh, that has not uh, happened. But what, is, what has happened, so what is different uh, from previous industrial revolutions in this one? And I think one of the major uh, differences is the picture that I show you uh, here. And we have a number of su such um, analysis in our, in our report. Um, so simply put, it is that online technology allows you to come up with an idea, to implement this idea, and to become the global leader in this idea in a very short period of time. That was not possible before. With previous industrial revolutions, it took tens or sometimes hundreds of years for, for new idea, let's say the steam engine, to start from, from a particular country and to spread around the world. So we show here just in the last uh, 70, 80 years, uh, IKEA, which is a global brand, basically took uh, around 75 years for IKEA to become a global uh, brand, 50 countries, about uh, $45 billion uh, in global uh, revenues. Then um, in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, the global economy opened up. So you see a company like Walmart, at the time the largest company in the world in terms of uh, sales and also market capitalization. So it takes about 45 years for Walmart to get to about 400, 450 billion dollars uh, in 30 countries. And then you see that it takes 15 years for Alibaba, or actually this is just part of Alibaba, Taobao, which is the online market, to get to about uh, nearly $800 billion and well, 220 countries and, and, uh, and territories, there are less than 220 uh, countries in the world. But just the scale with which you can use new technology to, be, to become global is huge. And, in the, and it's not only people say, well, but Alibaba is different. Well, it's not really different. It's different that it starts from a large market. But as we just discussed before the presentation, India is also a very large market. So there is no reason, other than the many reasons that, <laughs> that uh, my two um, uh, colleagues mentioned, why there shouldn't be an Indian company or five companies or 10 companies that can scale up uh, like this globally. In the report, we show a number of, uh, of, of companies around the world, including in some of the smaller emerging markets, that basically start in, a, in an area. Can be book selling, can be uh, online teaching courses, um, can be particular sales, can be particular financial services, and in three to five to seven years, basically become either a regional leader or global leader. That has never happened before. Before, it's taken much, much longer time. To become, uh, uh, to become global. So if you can grow so fast, the good news around uh, the people who are in these uh, companies is that a lot of jobs are created. But some jobs, as I mentioned, were displaced uh, as well. And then the discussion really is where are jobs created and can you become part of this, uh, of this accelerated development and what jobs are being displaced in traditional industries and what to do with the people who are in this uh, traditional um, uh, traditional uh, jobs. Just to show you scale, uh, so these are some of the latest numbers uh, in different uh, areas. So M-Pesa, for those of you who don't know, is basically an, um, uh, a, a Kenyan company that uh, is basically online payment system. Um, so it got created about 17 years ago as an online uh, payment company. By now you can see that relative to its scale, the largest Kenyan traditional banking group 
is about 8%. So, so it's 15 times larger than the largest uh, uh, traditional uh, bre uh, brick and mortar company. Airbnb, you know, uh, you know Airbnb, it's uh, more than twice as large um, uh, as uh, the largest hotel chain in, uh, in the world. And Didi um, is, uh, is basically a sharing um, a cap company in, um, in, uh, in China, which was created just about a decade ago. So that nine years ago it was uh, created. You already see that in terms of share of the taxi market, if you like. So it's much, much, much larger than all of the taxis in China combined. Uh, so it gives you this idea of scale becomes rapidly possible with this uh, new um, technology. So the possibility for growth, very fast growth, is what differentiates this industrial revolution, mostly services revolution, from previous um, uh, previous ones. So then how to be part of this? I, I think this is the, the discussion and we'll uh, continue after. I'll just show you a few more slides. So how to do this? Well, then governments need to think about how to help their businesses, as June 8 said, from being local to becoming global. And the report suggests a number of um, regulatory as well as uh, other areas where this, uh, uh, this needs to be done. But one particular area that the report is focusing is, is on skills. So to be part of this, uh, of this uh, new um, uh, services particular, particular trend, both in old sectors but also in new sectors, you need to basically rapidly reskill. Um, uh, reskill or rather attain these skills from uh, very early on um, and into the labor force. Um, so this, this illustrates, these are real ads actually, uh, um, newspaper ads that says that even in old sectors, so you know, what can be a more basic sector than basically hotel management? So these are two ads in Shanghai, the Hilton in Shanghai, China. Uh, for the same job, basically the entry-level management trainee. So if you compare the two, we've pulled them in, uh, in English um, uh, before, notice the top of the, so these are 30 years uh, roughly apart, notice at the top of uh, 2018. So it doesn't start with what you've studied or whether you know English, because by now everybody should know English. You can see that uh, even the ad, in fact, is in English. It starts with what we call social behavioral skills. It basically says you need to have positive attitude. Uh, now, my own country, uh, Bulgaria, is a sm small tourist destination, uh, and I can tell you that that's what's missing in our tour. Many other things are missing, but positive attitude is not something that you meet uh, typically in Bulgarian um, uh, hotels. <laughs> typically, you ask for something, and they say, don't bother me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so this, this uh, type of uh, uh, skills, but also notice the second one, ability to work independently and as part of a team. So none of that was, uh, was even a requirement uh, uh, before. So this, what we used to call soft skills, but now becoming more and more the important skills, especially uh, as uh, a lot of people work uh, uh, online, meaning that some of your team, engineering team, may be in a different country than the sales team, than the production team, and so on. So even for all jobs, the skills that you need to become, uh, to be good at them is, um, uh, is changing. At the same time, a lot of new jobs, as I mentioned, uh, due, to, um, uh, due to innovation are, um, are taking place. So here we've given and we've documented this uh, carefully around, uh, around the world, but some, uh, uh, some examples, including from India, where you know well these numbers, so that there are millions of uh, app developers in, uh, uh, in India, but we document a number of other professions that, you know, 10 years ago would have not existed at all, or would have been you know, called weird, for example, genetic counselors. So in, in the US, there are about 5,000 genetic counselors that did not exist uh, a decade ago. There's a master's degree, in fact, uh, started, started at the University of, um, of Texas that basically helps people think about their future generations. Uh, of, of, of what to do, including how to eat, what to study, and so on, in order to, um, for your uh, kids to be uh, more effective citizens in the, uh, in the future. So again, the report tries to bring a lot of new data to just make the point of how many new professions uh, are being created around, um, around the world. Um, 
so these new skills then ask the question, well, are, they, are these skills actually taught in the normal school system, starting from, um, from um, early childhood, as Junaid mentioned, then through the elementary and high school system, and then uh, to the universities? We cannot, we, meaning in this report, but also all of us, I think, cannot quite answer this uh, question uh, globally because it turns out that there is not sufficient data. So, for example, we don't know at the tertiary level, at the university level, at least around the world, um, what exactly uh, students uh, study in terms of uh, social-emotional skills versus hard skills versus um, uh, languages and uh, so on, to be able to say, are universities preparing people for the future of jobs um, or, or not? Uh, at the high school level, we have a bit more information, and actually India is one of the countries that has a lot more data and analysis than most countries around, uh, around the world. So that's why we um, start, and in the World Development Report, we will present for the first time a prototype, if you like, human capital index which basically asks this question. So for the new sectors that, um, that uh, are emerging, are the kids ready for them? So we ask a question, if a child is born today and enters the current state of health and education system in a country, let's say India, by the time they turn 18, are they ready for the future of work? So what's their human capital? Uh, online, you can see a lot of the uh, of the analysis behind this, but roughly what we do is that we say from 0 to 18, what is the state of the health system? What is the state of the education system? Not just how long you stay in school, which is traditionally what has been uh, looked at so far, but actually what you learn in school, much more importantly. So this is, in fact, the first time that the World Bank puts together this large 170 country uh, data set that uses PISA-like, um, PISA is this uh, OECD-based uh, measurement of test scores that we also use regional test scores, national test scores in countries like uh, India, and basically say you went to school, let's say, 12 years, but how much did you learn in these 12 years? What are your scores? Uh, and you put uh, years of learning and then the actual uh, learning. On the health side, we uh, use some simple indicators like stunting in kids, which is an issue still in some um, Indian states. And we also use average survival rate uh, as another indicator, which then takes uh, into account things like air pollution, sanitation, um, traffic accidents, um, which are you know, still an issue in many countries, including India. And to cut the long story short, put together all of this in a prototype human capital uh, index. We have shown the 170 countries in this index. We show a few. Uh, and if you show where India uh, sits on this uh, prototype index, remember one is, is very clear. So one is if you have an 18-year-old kid that is in perfect health, went to school, and did great at his or her exam. So that's one. And from there, every country basically goes... Um, uh, uh, as a proportion of one. Singapore comes closest to this ideal child that we all want to have. But even Singapore is around 0 0.9, 0 0.93. So even Singaporean kids are not quite as perfect as, um, as one wants to, uh, to uh, wish. But then look at India. This is uh, preliminary data, I should say. We're still um, uh, adding data for the next uh, two months or so. But India is right at around... Um, uh, well, slightly below 0.5. So one way to, to, to say this simply is that of the most efficient, if you like, health and education system that can exist to prepare human capital, India doesn't come even to half of that. So, so, so we can double the human capital uh, accumulation uh, of uh, Indian uh, uh, kids with some improvements and uh, health and education. We can discuss a bit more of this um, um, uh, later, I'll just go through two or three more slides and uh, conclude. Uh, Junaid mentioned that one of the biggest actually challenges in countries like, uh, uh, like uh, India is basically early childhood education, early childhood development. Because if you um, look, as I have in my team, through the latest neurological studies, neuroscience, and so on, they basically give you, particularly for people like myself whose kids are already teenagers, they give you this uh, slightly discouraging picture. They basically say most uh, social behavioral um, 
education, basically traits are learned between the ages of zero or even basically conception to um, uh, to uh, to about age five or six. At age five or six, a kid either is ready to sort of be a team player, work independently, uh, be creative, um, uh, have a positive attitude or not. And if they're not, it's very hard to do it later. You have a brief period during adolescence, 15, 16 year old, and that's it. If you then try, and we have documented a lot of uh, work, including by our colleagues at the World Bank, who try to, if you like, change behavior, uh, instill this type of skills in uh, adults, the results are very discouraging. Basically, you spend a lot of money with zero success. So you need to focus a lot on early childhood uh, development. This happens to be an area where I know that there are actually lots of projects in um, uh, in India, but generally speaking around the world, especially in emerging markets, this is badly missing. So there are many countries that they argue by culture, but uh, governments can always help in that regard. You sort of let the kids play or disregard them until they go to school and then hope that the school system is going to fill in. And the message here is by school, by the time that you are seven, you have missed the, the window uh, where most... Uh, most rapid improvement is, um, uh, is uh, important. Going back to the early messages and worries uh, in this literature, Future of Work, um, uh, which basically was stating that the loss of manufacturing jobs is, uh, is the biggest, let's say, problem with it. In our report, we say not really true, not only uh, because they're not really lost. In fact, the world is adding about 30 million manufacturing jobs a year. It's just that they're not in the US or UK. They're mostly in East Asia at the time. But actually, the biggest problem has always been, and India is a great example of that, informality. So that the vast majority of people, in fact, about two thirds in the whole world, including advanced economies of people, at the moment, working in formal uh, employment. What does informal employment mean? It means that they don't have a contract, they're not part of any um, formal organization, uh, um, labor unions, labor representation, they don't have social security, they don't have pensions. Two thirds in the world. This number for India is around 90% and has been remarkably uh, resilient. But you see a country, a neighboring country like Nepal, so basically, 90, so they're only 2% that are formal, of which about 1.5% is actually government employees. So you have half a percent of the whole working age population is in the formal economy. So that's the maximum that you can be actually in formal manufacturing, and that includes services and so on. So clearly, the problem is, uh, uh, or one of the issues is uh, here. And while over the last 20, 30 years, the World Bank and others have worked a lot to design plans to reduce informality, what we show in our report is that on average, informality is actually steadily increasing around the world. And it's increasing in a particularly interesting fashion. Advanced economies are actually becoming more informal uh, because of the gig economy and the rise of this um, temporary uh, uh, temporary uh, employment opportunities. Well, mostly because of population growth, informality in terms of number of people is also being increasing uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging economies. So the way that it is going in a, in a few decades, most of uh, already two thirds of the world are informal. It looks in a few, uh, in about 20 years actually, if the current projections are right, four out of every five jobs in the world would actually be informal. Uh, and that creates lots of issues for governments, including, and I will, um, uh, finish with this. Uh, two particular issues that the report talks uh, a lot about. I know you've done a lot of work in this uh, uh, in this area, so I'll just mention it. One is, which is related to uh, to the future, uh, the changing nature of work, is how do you do social protection? So if everybody is informal, what are the types of uh, channels in which you uh, ensure social protection? Not just for the people who already are informal, or without a job, but also for the people who would have to make this painful transition between the old sectors that I showed you at the beginning and the new sectors. And this may be a short period, this may be a, a long transition um, 
period, but now for this group of uh, people who previously had fairly well-paid, secure jobs, but now for either for a period of time or for a long period of time would also be uh, less protected. So how do you think of a new social protection uh, system? We call this towards a new social contract and we have a number of uh, thoughts about it. Uh, I know that our hosts also have worked a lot on, uh, on this, so in the questions and answers we can, uh, we can answer this. Um, a lot of uh, politicians, including, by the way, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in India, have said, well, why don't we think of a universal basic income? Uh, I know that this has been a topic in uh, India. In fact, uh, now former chief economic advisor, Arvid Subramanian, last year, actually this January, had this uh, uh, globally uh, famous quote that said, basically, within the next 18 months, at least two Indian states would have universal basic income. So in the report, we have an interesting section, uh, which is also within the World Bank fairly controversial, to show that if that happens, it would bankrupt the particular state. So I hope that I'm not part of these two, um, uh, two states. But what we show here with a very, very basic universal basic income, so just to get to the poverty, to get everybody above the poverty level of the particular um, uh, uh, jurisdiction, state, or, or, or country, how much would it take in terms of additional government revenue as a percent of uh, GDP? So let's say for a low middle income country like, uh, like India, basically to cover just the adult population, it would take about five percentage points of, um, of GDP in additional revenues. To cover basically the whole population of, uh, of the particular state or country, it's nearly 10%, so 9% of GDP. Uh, now, as, as I was as was mentioned, I'm a former finance minister. So, if somebody tells me you need to raise between five to ten percent of GDP per um, uh, in additional tax revenue, I'll tell you it's impossible. I can raise one, I can raise two, two and a half, perhaps, but going to five or, or, or ten is basically impossible for for any. Um, reasonable country over a period of time. And once you go to low-income countries, basically it costs 20% of GDP. To give you the, the dimensions, actually they're probably on the next slide, here's the, here the comparison. So on average, low-income countries only raise about 12% of GDP currently in tax revenues. So imagine above this 12% to raise another 20%. Um, it's impossible. Middle-income countries like... Um, India, I don't know what the Indian number is, but on average, it's about 15%. Raising another 5 to 10% of, uh, of uh, GDP is clearly a very, very, very difficult, I would say, impossible task. So clearly, you need to think of steps to go towards this uh, universal coverage or different ways to, uh, to write a social, um, a social contract. Uh, we have some suggestions in the report how to think about it and what some countries have tried and mostly failed, I should say. In fact, I'll perhaps finish with, uh, with uh, this. The only country in the world actually that has tried a universal basic income is interestingly Mongolia. Mongolia a few years ago had uh, um, a lot of uh, revenues coming from gold. They have large gold mines. So the government perhaps reasonably said, why don't we create a universal basic income of the type that I mentioned here. So everybody is above the poverty line. So it doesn't give you more. It just gets everybody above the poverty line. The system existed 15 months and the government went bankrupt. <laughs> uh, because, why? Not that the government somehow was stupid, uh, but they did not calculate the vast majority of people who were informal. So the moment that they created the scheme, suddenly people that they were not seeing before yes. came up and said, I'm also a Mongolian citizen, so I'm part of, uh, of this. So the, the, the scheme became so much bigger than it was before that it took exactly 15 months for the government to, um, uh, to go uh, bankrupt and stop the system so it no longer exists. I'll finish here. The report has a number of country examples that may be of use to, um, uh, to India, but we're also at the stage where we can benefit from your comments. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, and the painting, I don't know whether they are art uh, aficionados among you. So this is a painting that we, um, this is Diego Rivera's uh, uh, painting of how, of how, which was painted in 1930. 
and is at the San Francisco Museum of Art of how the future of work uh, uh, was according to him. So this is a 1930 painting. Actually, this is half of it, the report. Uh, the report is back in cover. The interesting part of it uh, uh, is that actually in his future, those of you who don't know Diego Rivera, he was a communist. So he was self-professed communist, part of the Communist Party in Mexico, uh, friend of Trotsky and so on, but still his future of work, and we have a chapter of this in the report, was one woman, you can see at the very huh? corner, one woman and 19 men, uh, <laughs> including this... Uh, this person sitting right there is Diego Rivera himself, so he's sitting without, with his um, back. But uh, something that I did not mention is that uh, social inclusion in terms of gender is something that the report does uh, write about and worries in this new world of work. There are some opportunities for women, uh, especially in countries that uh, otherwise uh, have less... Uh, less available uh, jobs for them, but also lots of challenges like for the rest of us. Thank you. Jeanette. You know, it's, uh, it's fascinating watching this uh, report evolve. So if I add a few more examples, I would talk about the work uh, that we're doing in partnership uh, with government on sanitation. I would talk about the whole story of labor force participation of women falling. Uh, but when I look at it broadly, there is nowhere where I would sit and start having arguments with uh, India on policy directions. I have deep, deep, deep concerns about state capability. Uh, so the whole issue of service delivery and state capability is, uh, for me, the big takeaway as I listen uh, to, this, uh, to this presentation, because it's on the services on the ground uh, that if the state capability can, uh, can deliver, India is well on its way of not being at index level 0.5. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a legacy of many, many years of, of, of the, the state capability not delivering. Uh, and, and I think that that's the, the real uh, crux uh, for those who are on, on the ground. I think with this, let's open it up and let's bring you in. Mr. Bhalla, you were uh, <laughs> in, in, invoked uh, in the very beginnings. Maybe I should come to you and then I'll come to Sabina and then I'll go around the table. Uh, that you have done and the report has done. Um, I, you know, my DNA is plus plus, so I end up a lot more optimistic um, than you do, and I'll try and delineate some of the reasons why. Um, you know, and going backwards, I mean, I, I think your last two slides were <clears throat> the crux of the matter as to what, from a policy point of view, um, what governments uh, will be facing. Um, two points on that. First, the, you know, if you have, and UBI is something I've, I've worked on, and actually um, the numbers come out a lot less uh, for India. I haven't done it for anybody else. Um, and particularly if you now think about it as negative income tax, uh, it comes out less. And targeting. So um, let's take the targeting point that if you have that, look, um, you know, f to get your supplement, and first of all, we now have technology that we know broadly what the income levels of the people will be. So that makes targeting that much easier. And then financing of it um, is also that you can have, and this is a proposal of Jay Panda, who's a member of parliament, was a member of parliament, and a very astute uh, parliamentarian and a thinker, um, that he said that, look, you know, you have in the village areas, wherever it is, you have to go to the office to claim it, uh, to claim the money, which means everybody around this table won't be going, and so on and so forth. So I think, um, but it, it is absolutely, absolutely essential that uh, governments around the world will have to think of a supplement to income. So I, I really, really liked uh, the last two slides. Um, I'll just make two or three other points. Um, and again, it, it stems from my DNA. Um, one, 
I don't think you need, you know, you started off with, uh, when he said provocative, comment of inequality in the world is increasing around the world. Um, one, you don't need that for any of your work, any of your conclusions. Uh, and it happens to be wrong. So I wouldn't bring that up. Um, I've done a lot of work on this. Inequality in the world today is back to the levels last observed in 1870. Um, there is a Piketty uh, stuff and Chancellor Piketty stuff, uh, which has come under a lot of discussion, even in the US, where they say it went from 9 to 23 percent, the share of the top 1 percent, and our US scholars are saying maybe it went from about 10 to 13. Um, UK and the US are the two countries in the world where you have inequality going up. UK has peaked and is down below. Um, take Eastern Europe, uh, take Western Europe, take Latin America, take Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they take any country you want. Inequality today is lower. They may have very high South Africa, very high levels of inequality, but trends in inequality are lower, and certainly global inequality is a lot lower than it has ever been. Last but not least, related to that, um, education. If you think of gender inequality, has from a level of 100, has come down to something like 30. Just two days ago, in India, in India, mind you, with all of its biases, and we killed the girl child, as you well know, uh, even that is declining, but we still, uh, we are famous uh, in quotes, uh, to kill the girl child along with China. There are, forget humanities, in the sciences, more women undergraduates than men in India, okay? So in the new cohort, in the old cohort, no. So, uh, you know, it's a, and last point on the deindustrialization. That has, you know, and you should have a reference, maybe you do, by uh, Robert Lawrence's work, where this, the U.S., it's very striking, the deindustrialization in the U.S. has proceeded at the same pace since 1960. Not, you know, it's a perfect fit. Um, so that's not a, a new phenomenon. Maybe for us it's a new phenomenon, but uh, maybe we also never had it that way. So I will just, I would end up with the world is uh, going to be a better place for everybody, but um, only if there is a supplement to income for those who are losing out. Relatively losing out, not absolute. Thank you. Uh, I'll come to you, ma'am. Um, do you want to collect a few and I'll come back yes. to you? Uh, periodically, I will revert to you yeah. uh, so that you can I, respond. I, just have, yeah. I have a question for Junaid as to on the firm size, which I think is a <laughs> critical. We've discussed what is the World Bank finding as a major reason why the Indian firm size is off the charts, i.e., non-existent. <laughs> okay, Samina. So uh, you can introduce yourself and the work you're doing. Thank you, Samir. Uh, I just wanted to start by uh, bringing up something that my colleague to the left, Rocco, mentioned that uh, Diego Rivera probably never imagined that he would be better known for being his wife's husband rather than his <laughs> artwork. So. There you go. Um, my name is Sabina Dewan. I'm the executive director of a think tank called Just Jobs Network. We're a global think tank with a presence in Washington and in India. And we've actually been quite involved in providing comments on the report, um, as well as with the Sankalp project um, through MSDE. Um, but I'd like to just make two quick points and then end with two questions. Uh, the first is that I was very heartened to uh, to uh, have Junaid's comments about the education to skills continuum, because I think that that's an absolutely critical thing that we must highlight. In countries like India and across other emerging and developing uh, economies, what we see is that the skills, uh, the push for skills is actually at the expense of education. And I think for uh, for the future of work and for the changing nature of work. I like, I prefer that title than the future of work, sorry, Samir. I think it's really important to have a requisite level of education before you can actually capitalize on human potential. Otherwise, you end up with 
exactly the scenario where India is now, where you have a bunch of, you know, 356 million youth between the ages of 15 and 25, um, very few of which actually have any prospects for economic mobility because of this kind of bent. So I think, uh, and I would urge the report to actually highlight this extremely visibly, that it's not just about skills. It's about the continuum from education uh, education to skills. That's one point. The second point I wanted to make is, again, I compliment the report on uh, questioning the stylized facts. What I like to say is busting myths. Um, I, I, I would say that it's, it's uh, along those lines that it's not so much about manufacturing versus services or agriculture, that it's more about a, a, a productivity and jobs interplay. Um, the fact that the conventional wisdom is that as productivity rises, uh, jobs decline. It's an oversimplified version of that. But what I think is very interesting is that in certain sectors like agriculture or healthcare, for example, in a number of developing and emerging market economies, where productivity is so low, you could introduce technology and other product productivity raising factors that actually lead to an expansion of economic activity that leads to more jobs. And so I think that that kind of interplay and uh, not treating technology and, and productivity as a monolith, but actually looking specifically at those factors could shed much more light on the issue and bring the discussion forward than sort of the 10,000 foot level. And finally, I'll end with two questions. One is, um, I've been doing a lot of work with Vietnam and on Vietnam, um, and they are very concerned about the whole reshoring, uh, you know, the reshoring process and how how some of it is already happening and what might happen in the future. So I'd be curious on your take mm -hmm. on that. And the second question on that the I jobs going back. So, sorry. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. The res reshoring of sure. of work um, with technology, making it possible to produce things at home as opposed to overseas, and so the jobs migrating back. Um, and then the second question is: um, uh, so it's not so much about which sectors the jobs are created in, but also what kind of jobs. So if if we are sort of seeing a, a prospect where service jobs are being created, traditionally service jobs tend to have lower quality than manufacturing jobs. And so what does this kind of shift mean for the quality of jobs and the social contract and employment relationship, as, as Samir had mentioned? Um, and then I just want to say a big shout out on the UBI. It, it, it crawls under my skin when people mm -hmm. say that UBI is a good idea, not just because of the, the affordability, but also for the meaning of the purpose of work in mm -hmm. people's lives and what it means when that goes away. So we cannot be thinking of alternatives. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks, the, Samir. The future of work hashtag is, is shorter for Twitter than the changing the nature of work. That's why the future it's of true, work. It's true, but the I, future we have to be is now. Friendly. The future uh, is now. And, and second, I think. Yeah. UBI is good. <laughs> UBI is good no. because you have the capitalists from California and a country with socialism in its constitution agree. So when you have capitalism and socialism agree, it's a good idea. Oh. Ma'am. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Monica. I'm a research fellow at Institute of Social Studies Trust. Uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. I have uh, a small comment and two, of two questions to Simeon and one to Junaid. Uh, Simon, I'll go to you first. Uh, I would like you to explain a little more about how the report talks about women's participation, considering that you know women's participation is falling. Uh, in our research, we are seeing that one is one reason for women's participation falling is also the way women's participation is getting calculated. A lot of unpaid work it doesn't even get counted. So women are working in terms in multitasking ways, but is it really getting counted? So one is counting. The other is number of things in terms of maternity benefits, in terms of child care and all that is not at all looked, up, looked into. So how are other countries, if there are any examples about how other countries are looking into women coming, could explain a little bit on that. The other is, of course, you know, Alibaba thing is great. And, you know, if, if technology can be used, you can go to millers. But what about Uber? So, you know, we see that Uber has come to India in a big way. Number of people bought taxis. And now they are under big loans. Uber doesn't have anything to lose, but I have spoken to a lot of taxi people and they say the children have come from private school to government schools or some have even left schools because, you know, they are under, slowly the, the Uber policies are such that they have stopped the, all the, you know, different profits and benefits that the drivers were getting. And, you know, these people are in a mess. 
so what about regulations in terms of policy? You know, how can the governments really make it a little more st uh, strengthen this whole uh, uh, way, you know, economy can work? Mm -hmm. uh, my question to Junaid is, though you do say that implementation is a problem, and uh, definitely I am with you in that, but do you think uh, there is a huge disconnect, specifically in the Indian context, between how policies are made and how policies are thought of being implemented? So do you think there's a problem in terms of how policy, uh, you know, kind of assumes how policy, you know, considering that India is a very diverse country. You, we have these tribal uh, pockets, we have SC okay. pockets, and we have a huge caste and class diversity. You think that there's a huge problem there? The other, just one small comment I want there to make. There are others waiting also. And you just know, one small uh, comment. Uh, a comment? Yeah, it's okay. a small comment. Uh, Ms. Bhalla just uh, said that, you know, women are rising in education. That's right. But men are falling. They are, there's a huge dropout in terms of men coming out of. So there's a lot of Point. studies in terms yeah. of that. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I now only have three hands, and I want to give him a good five, seven minutes to respond to maybe fifteen questions that you would have by the end of it, and I want to give Junaid a couple of minutes as well. Uh, I'm going to bring in Apko, uh, uh, sir. Please go ahead, then Niranjan and Gautam, right? But I, I really want to bring in more uh, women voices here. So uh, Terry, I think you want you need to be coming in. Archana needs to be coming. I, I don't want so much testosterone in this room. So, uh, so uh, please, uh, 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 Sir, so, go ahead. And then I will bring Archana, Terry, Gautam, Niranjan. My name is Vinod Saigal. A very short suggestion comment. One is, I suggest in spite of what has been said in World Bank reports, if there is not, there should be an average global Gini coefficient. Mm -hmm. Number two, the question is, at what point do all these projections collapse? especially in the case of countries that have still got rising populations. India will have 350 more billion people by three, uh, 2050, Pakistan over 300 million, and Nigeria still over three point will double in about 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. All these countries are still also the ones with the lowest birth rate. Simultaneously, where the world flu programs are being sent to Somalia, South Sudan. Surprisingly, the population is still rising. Isn't it possible for the World Bank and the UN agencies supporting that along with feeding these people, they spend 25% of the money on educating them on family planning and making the aids available? Okay. And my last point is, it, the state will come also due to rapid ecological decline that we may have to legislate a slowdown. For example, instead of manufacturing new cars every one year, every five years, mm. because this is much too rapid a growth. Thank you very much. OK, so um, uh, Archana, um, I'll bring you in as well. But why don't you go ahead, Archana? No, that's OK. I can speak loudly, and I, I'm sure that people can hear. Hi. My name is Archana Virasan. I work with Gates Foundation. Thank you so much for um, a good presentation and, and this important uh, so two questions quickly for you, and I know that there are many other questions really. So the Human Capital Index, it would be useful to, to understand it in its disaggregated form in terms of for it to be actionable, are you actually recommending health outcomes to go up versus education outcomes, outcomes to go up? The second uh, question that I have is that the Human Capital Index would look very different because at this point in time, you're gender agnostic, right? So if, uh, if you were to cut it by gender, because the learning outcomes, as I believe, do not really differ when, when you think of men and women mm -hmm. or girls and boys differently, but what would the human capital index look like? But, but the health outcomes look very different, right? So if it was disaggregated even by gender, what would that look like? Okay, I'll come to you, ma'am. Now we are on the speed, ta speed talk format, 30 seconds each. <laughs> I want to bring everyone in. I'm Anvesha. I'm from Institute of Social Studies Trust. Very quickly, adding on to what you already said when you talk about unpaid care work, A is what is the future of work vis-a-vis -vis unpaid care work? And the second thing is where does organizing and negotiations in labor relationships feature in the future of work? Because this is something that's really being pushed back from all fronts. So, you know, that point. Thank you. Um, so, I now got them. Niranjan. Hi. Uh, 
uh, fascinating report and uh, it's quite much in tune with all the other reports that I've been reading for several years now. Uh, you mentioned that we do a lot, the report does a lot of copy pasting of what is happening in America and UK and puts it onto these, uh, the other countries as well. And I think from what I've heard so far, perhaps your report is headed in the same direction, as, at least as far as India goes. Half the people in, half the labor in India, the work that happens in India is in the agricultural sector. Uh, by not talking about it or not talking or not exploring the technological upgrades that could happen through gr and resulting greater productivity in agriculture, uh, you are perhaps uh, missing something vital uh, in the Indian workforce dynamic. Second thing, um, we keep talking about it and all of us do want to see an Alibaba from India and more Alibaba. There should be 50 Alibabas from India in terms of scale uh, that, that the entire system uh, is going against uh, uh, allowing companies to grow big and so on and so forth, uh, which is fine. And may these companies grow and may we have a lot of them. But I think in India, major jobs are created in the smaller companies. And I'm not even talking about small, I'm talking about tiny sector. So the, the large amount of jobs that are created in the tiny, the small, and some of them in the medium, SME as they are known as, uh, is where the major jobs are happening and the major work will likely happen. Uh, I think by not, maybe your report does explore it, but we, we haven't heard much. Uh, finally, uh, India is another, uh, it is in a unique place where, uh, when we talk about the future of work, we imagine robots and productivity and technology and so on and so forth. But in India, we have all the four industrial revolutions happening simultaneously. Mm. So uh, I think the exploration and the intersection of jobs and work with these four uh, industrial revolutions also needs to be explored, at least as far as India goes. Thank you. Uh, Niranjan. Uh, thank you, Samit. Uh, I just have a... <clears throat> sort of uh, comment on uh, state of uh, scenario in India uh, with regard to higher education scenario. If you look at our higher education uh, thing, uh, we are probably uh, expanded in last 15, 20 years a lot, like added another 150 new universities and uh, several few thousands, you know, engineering college and so on. But if you look at the quality, uh, other things actually, we probably uh, in a different uh, <clears throat> scale altogether. And uh, if you look at uh, the report, uh, NASCOM report recently, only 2% of our engineering graduates can actually really make value addition to, you know, the, the work uh, uh, they are uh, doing. Uh, so in a sense, actually, if you look at, uh, we have a young population, two third of population, uh, we, we know that uh, are below 35. And, and the nature of job is changing so rapidly. Uh, and if you look at our... Uh, lack of strong institution, especially the higher education institution and the system, regulatory system, if you're looking at, we are now debating about having a regulatory, sort of higher education regulatory system today. So if this is the scenario, uh, how do you actually think India can really lift frog and, you know, probably uh, address some of these weaknesses, which will take a lot of time, actually. It cannot happen even in decade, a couple of decades. So where does India actually is, uh, what are the real, you know, a sort of uh, tools and instrument that India can actually take in the shorter term, at least to uh, take care of these sort of challenges. Um, we uh, probably, uh, so we started late, so I'll, we can probably end uh, 10 minutes late if, if, it's, if both of you will permit. Uh, I will take the yeah, last intervention. And, and one from Terry, the one who runs the program here. Where is she? She's there, yeah. She, one sentence, yeah. adding to what Ranjan said, you see, there is a huge gap between, uh, I did not introduce myself, I am, I am Ajay Mehra, I am principal of a, a Delhi University College, uh, which is an evening college. So we really get, uh, you know, students which are average to uh, bright and, you know, different potentials. Uh, <clears throat> you see the huge gap between the school education and, you know, the entry level of higher education. And that also reflects you know, in postgraduate education. Mm. So, you know, unless we map this out, mapping the skill part in India is going to be very difficult. I think you need to factor that in. Thank you. Uh, uh, final intervention, Terry. Sir, please. 
intervention. Hi, Thank everyone. You. I'm Terry. I'm leading our research on the future of work at ORF. So two quick points. Uh, the first is I think it's worth exploring the interlinkages between inequality and informality. So our research suggests that most people are actually, of course, interested in secure full-time jobs. And yet we're seeing an increase in informal opportunities. So how can we think about you know, who those opportunities are going to go to and what that means for inequality? And the second is I would like to sort of second the point that was made uh, on an overemphasis on skills rather than education. So I think we can't skip the education piece uh, and just look at skills, but education still remains a key foundation. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Okay. And, and do you want to uh, uh, mention the two big surveys you're doing? I yes. think that those are important. Oh. And I think it's coming a little late for your current report, but maybe as an addendum, we can do some blocks for you. Yeah. yeah so... Uh, Okay. So uh, we're doing two major surveys at ORF. The first is an enterprise survey. So we're looking at 800 companies and four sectors. And essentially, we're looking at the, the pace and adoption of different technologies in these companies, primarily small, medium, and large size companies, to see how that's impacting job roles, uh, tasks, the activities required in their hiring practices. So we're trying to generate some evidence on how the future of work is actually playing out in the Indian context. Uh, and then we're also doing a youth aspiration survey. So we're surveying 6,000 youth around India, and we're trying to understand sort of what their aspirations in terms of employment and education look like. So that's You have something really urgent to say. Please go ahead. I can't say no to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm K.K. Roy Chaudhary. I'm an independent consultant, energy, environment, uh, climate change areas. I was wondering what should be the key drivers to... To, to be envisaged to drive the future of work and the role of human capital. Uh, Mr. Seban mentioned about Vietnam uh, driving manufacturing. We also started um, <clears throat> recently, I mean, uh, with the new government coming in, this uh, making India mission to drive manufacturing in India. Uh, what are the uh, <clears throat> prospects of uh, uh, thinking in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, differentiating between generation and conversion. Manufacturing drives conversion only. Uh, it's a uh, uh, law of conservation of mass. It only promotes conversion. But where are we generating? And why not those things be the basis to drive all these things? Thank you. Thank you. Great. So uh, we'll now, uh, Junaid, do you want to go first? Go ahead. So I, I think you had a, a fewer set of questions. Yes, yes. So you can... Uh... <laughs> I, I was actually going to answer his question. I was going to answer mine. Just okay. Um, so on... First, this issue on, on policy making. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think that there's a, a very interesting discussion and debate today about India's federalism uh, and the role of the third tier of government. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, to bring the state closer to the people is going to be essential in that gap that you see between policy making and and uh, and the uh, and the reflections of of citizenships uh, of citizens. So I think the uh, the the story of how panchayats evolve and how uh, urban local governments evolve, I think, is going to be central. Uh, to reflecting the diversity of India's citizens into into that state, uh, so I'm uh, I'm someone who, while paying respect to technology and the ability to go directly to citizens with service delivery and so on, and so on the linkage between citizens and the state, I think, is at the local level, and how India's federalism evolves, I think, will be uh, very very critical uh, from that perspective. Um, on the story of uh, the size. Uh, Surjit, we are in the process of coming out with a, a, uh, a series of, uh, uh, of analysis. And what I'm beginning to see is that there is no one path to the, uh, the economic size. We're seeing uh, problems on the labor market side. Uh, we're seeing problems on access to finance. We're seeing problems on access to services that are all combining. And we're also seeing, very interesting, you, you get tariff liberalization happening, but you don't see prices uh, reflect this. There, there are monopolies here in the marketing and so on that needs needs to be addressed. So uh, Rinku is leading this work, Rinku Murgai, and what I've really appreciated from it is that there is no silver bullet in this story, but 
the linkages between these different aspects are coming out. Um, but but this but the, the the series of reports are, are coming out uh, 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 soon. On the on the spectrum, I think it's absolutely right. I think today you'll find uh, the conversation is not education versus skills. Uh, it is really about a, a spectrum. And in fact, we're looking at early childhood. We're looking at skillings. We're looking at remedial education, and we're looking at uh, skilling as a as a spectrum and trying to understand how one fits uh, 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 fits into uh, into the other. In fact, uh, K.P. Krishnan, the Secretary of uh, uh, Skills uh, uh, Ministry, made a very fascinating uh, comment the other day. He says, he is not yet convinced whether skilling, skills should be a separate ministry or should be best part of, uh, of education in order to create that complement. And for him to say that uh, is, is a very powerful statement of how how the thinking is uh, within within the ministry, but KP is quite an extraordinary uh, 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 policy uh, policy uh, um, uh, maker. Anyway, last point I'd like to make is on on agriculture. Um, the work that we're doing on agriculture is very clear that uh, uh, India uh, has achieved its story of food security. It now has to shift its whole production system on agriculture especially if you take into account the fact that you are a water-scarce nation and that water is going to be such a binding, uh, is already a binding constraint. So shifting out of uh, water-guzzling crops, moving into value addition crops, all of that is linked to technology and the type of jobs uh, that will need to emerge in, in, uh, in agriculture. And then if you add to it climate change and, and, and the need to create resilient uh, uh, agricultural policy, uh, you're absolutely right that agriculture technology interface is going to be quite powerful. The other uh, uh, linkage that I think we don't talk about enough is rural economy are very is very closely linked to small towns. Uh, the the symbiosis between small towns, small urban centers, mm -hmm. and the rural economy is huge, and that's something that I think uh, uh, policymakers have not really focused on uh, uh, yet. Um, so at least in our work, uh, we're, we're certainly looking at, uh, at that linkage. Simeon. Thank you. So I'll go chronologically. Um, and I wrote a lot. So in about two weeks, you should see changes in the draft, uh, maybe <laughs> even in some, some things that I wouldn't be able to address immediately. So um, first, um, technology. So I skipped a lot of the report, so actually we do cover some topics uh, like agriculture, for example, that I didn't uh, talk about. But one of the very practical um, um, sections that we have to, to, to the first gentleman is technology now helps us in many uh, in many instances to reach people, as you as you suggested correctly, that we couldn't reach before. Um, and we have many, particularly for social protection. So previously, if you're informal, so if you don't work in a large uh, uh, company and if, if you're not urban, basically it's very difficult for you to be covered uh, because we don't know where you are. I mentioned the Mongolia example that, uh, you know, they created universal basic income and about 30% more people showed up in the country. They should have known how, how large the population is, but about 30% more um, users... Uh, uh, showed up. So we have a number of, uh, of uh, examples in our uh, study from around the world where either at the state level or at the country level, um, I mentioned or I showed here M-Pesa in, uh, in uh, Kenya, which is basically an online payment system, a uh, 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 digital payment provider. Well, the Kenyan government is actually fairly creatively using them to say, we have lots of informality, but we know people because they use their phones, so we know who they are uh, because nearly 92% of the Kenyan population has phones. So now with this technology, we can reach them for social services. We cannot reach them for our registries, but we can reach them this way. Mexico has a similar, um, a similar program, basically through consumption, from, again, a version of online payments that they say we can create a pension system and actually an insurance system we don't know where you work, but we know what you consume. So for every dollar that you consume, we are basically going to create a system that you put away two cents, and then the government pays two cents into, into an account. So technology actually does help the type of programs that, um, that uh, you've mentioned. 
universal basic income or any type of other uh, targeted uh, uh, program, and that's that's good news. You also write that we don't need the story of uh, inequality to be true, and in fact, that's what we make, uh, maybe I wasn't clear, in the report, that's what we point out. So we are very careful at the country level and also to the gentleman at the global level to say, let's look at Gini coefficients, let's look at the top 10%, top 25%, and so on, and we can show you that actually inequality is falling, with the exception of rich Anglo-Saxon countries, so Correct. US, UK, Australia, and a bit Canada, actually are the four countries where inequality is, um, at least over the last decade or so, has been uh, increasing, although, as you said, maybe it's peaking in some of these countries. But even in the other advanced economies, and I didn't get to that, but you know, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, basically all of continental Europe, actually inequality is, uh, is falling quite significantly and manufacturing jobs are actually being created. So if you look at the sort of central European um, um, uh, industry, actually manufacturing jobs are not being lost or not they're being, uh, uh, being created. So even among rich countries, actually the story is quite, uh, mixed. quite mixed. And when I present this in Germany, they say, well, it's simple. So the Americans have a problem because they don't have a social protection system. So if you don't have a social protection system, what do people do? Well, they have to drive, drive Uber uh, sort of as a second or third job because otherwise they're poor. Well, in Germany or in Austria or in uh, the Netherlands, when I was presenting uh, recently, they say they have, we have a reasonably functioning social protection system and our people don't have to do it. Uh, so, so even in advanced economies, they're quite different. One of the main points that I take, and we will change this in the report, is that I agree you need to have a requisite level of education to be able to uh, basically get uh, uh, the skills and then retool with uh, further skills that you need. So we will change this. Uh, uh, and we will cite you if you give me, so I know who to, uh, who to cite. V Vietnam, Vietnam reshoring. Um, I also recently was in Vietnam, and indeed they're quite worried about reshoring, which is actually interesting because I mentioned globally, Vietnam is the number one economy in terms of uh, annual growth of, uh, of jobs. So Vietnam is what previously China was doing to the world in terms of adding particularly manufacturing jobs. Now Vietnam is doing it. It's a smaller economy, but proportionately, they're actually going, growing faster than any country else in the world. Um, to, 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 to one of your points. What is worrying not for them and actually not for East Asia, I think East Asia with all of their worries about reshoring, they have fairly high human capital, the way that we define it in the requisite level of education. They continue actually to uh, keep um, building uh, manufacturing uh, and actually some services job. What's not happening for economies, this global value chain idea that as wages rise in China, then they go to Vietnam. As wages rise in Vietnam, they should be going further down the chain. And you know, all of Africa is waiting for that. Much of South Asia is waiting for that. Some of uh, the Middle East, and that's not happening. So all the manufacturing jobs globally are being redirected from advanced economies, some advanced economies, towards East Asia, and they get stuck there. So the question is, which I don't have a full answer. What is it about East Asia that keeps so the, the global value chain is cut there? So if India is hoping to get manufacturing jobs, probably not going to happen. At least it's not happening um, now. If Africa is hoping to get manufacturing jobs, it's not happening. Why? I don't know the full answer, but it seems that relative to other countries at similar income levels, East Asia, and you maybe saw uh, at my graph on the human capital, much higher basic levels of education, much higher than income per, per capita. And also actually, which we also didn't discuss, but is in the report, basic infrastructure. So these countries have heavily invested in human capital, heavily invested in basic infrastructure. If you don't have basic infrastructure, you cannot export. So it's fine to produce it, but how are you going to, uh, uh, to export? So you need, uh, uh, so you need uh, both. Women participation, actually, we do have a full section in the report talking about this, not about the topic of unpaid work. This came to us relatively uh, recently, and I agree it's a big topic. We haven't, unfortunately, covered it uh, much. 
but but yet but we have a few a couple more months but uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time talking about women participation in what the government can do so you mentioned child care so you know if you don't have a basic child care system you can come up with lots and lots of other rationale why women should be in the labor force but they cannot because somebody has to take care of the children and this is an issue in emerging economies it's also an issue in some rich countries so the netherlands for example has the lowest uh, women's participation rate in of any oecd count sorry of any european union country why is that the case it happens to be a country that actually doesn't have child care in the sense that germany has sweden has and so on it's kind of an odd country in uh, uh, in Europe, but we, we comment on child care, uh, care around the world, and that is an issue in rich countries as well, including in the US, incidentally. So the reason that, uh, one of the reasons for women participation falling quite precipitously actually lately in the US is that, that what do you do? I mean, we've had children there, it's very expensive to, um, uh, to do it. One topic that we didn't discuss at all, but that please read chapter two of the report is, Somebody mentioned Uber, uh, Airbnb, so they create lots of opportunities, but they create huge problems. So actually, this report, many of these 200,000 hits uh, downloads have come from Google, Uber, and <laughs> Amazon who have been complaining and complaining that we misrepresent and that they're great companies and so on. <laughs> but they create many issues. So they create the worker protection or lack of worker protection Complaint. issue that you mentioned. They, they create huge competition issues because, and there are by now some cases, both at the country level, at the global level, for, and we report this, um, where companies like Google basically start buying out or basically preventing other companies from growing. So they become so big and this, in this new um, nature of work, this is possible. You basically really become a market monopolist very, very quickly. It's good on the one hand, it's problematic on the other uh, hand. So competition uh, policy issues are huge. I would say at this point, no country has resolved this. The European Union now is trying to do some, um, uh, something, but not yet successfully. A big issue, which is close to my heart as a finance person, is taxation. These companies pay no taxes globally. So, so they just totally, we call it tax avoidance, this is like the polite uh, term to say it, but we document it. On average, you know, Google pays less than 1% corporate income tax around the world. So because the arguments they didn't pay here, they didn't pay there, they say, well, no, but we paid there. So we do a global study for these companies to show that they totally avoid taxation. So this is something that governments need to do something. And we have a number of uh, suggestions, both at the country level, as well as at the global level, what can be done. Otherwise, the resources that we need to invest in social protection or to uh, invest in um, human capital are diminishing. Not only they're not increasing, but with these companies becoming big global players, they siphon off um, money from other countries. Global Gini coefficient, actually, uh, sir, we do, we are not quite there, but within two or three weeks, we will have a global Gini coefficient, uh, as you mentioned. Family planning, great topic. We don't have much, unfortunately, in this uh, report. We thought that we've uh, stepped on too many already kind of contentious issues. So if we put uh, <laughs> family planning, you know, I'd be probably looking for another uh, job. <laughs> Human capital index, it is actually, I didn't present it here, but we do have it gender disaggregated. So gender disaggregated and health and education separately. And um, so you're right in health, the differences uh, once you gender disaggregate are quite large. I would say that in learning actually they are large too, but in different ways. So women, at least for the type of uh, uh, numbers that we have actually, do learn significantly better, sorry, girls learn significantly better than boys across the world. It's quite tremendous. I was, uh, I mean, the data globally are quite interesting. In some regions like the Middle East, the difference is huge. So girls basically do great, relatively speaking, at uh, learning in school. The problem is that once they graduate, they have no opportunities to work. So, so then we also, uh, we also study returns, if you like, to work after education. And you see this very strange phenomena in the Middle East um, and actually in Central Asia as well. Girls' returns to education are about twice as large in these uh, regions than boys. Once they are supposed to enter the labor force, so once they finish, they turn to negative returns. So basically they forgot what they learned in a period of two or three years. So that's an issue. So we need to find... Um, 
uh, well, we need to convince some governments uh, that uh, job opportunities are as important as, um, as learning. Organized relations, unions, it's a very good question. We have a short section on it, but not, we just discussed this before, before we came. Not many ideas. On the one hand, technology allows you to reach many more people, mm -hmm. aggregations. On the other hand, and you know, this is also one of the contentious points in the report, labor unions have completely not just missed this point, they've been against it for one simple reason, that labor unions around the world typically represent the formal workforce. So the 2% in Nepal, the you know, 2.5% in India and so on. So aggregations are possible, but whether this would happen in the current form of labor unions, I don't think so, actually. Correct. I think you need another, another aggregation, but I'll leave this thorny question to, um, to you. Alibaba size. So I think one thing that, uh, that also to a question that, uh, that Junaid answered, India is a very large market, but actually it's not a single market. So this is different from the US or, um, or uh, China that truly in the services sector operate like a single market. So there is one thing that we mentioned in the report is that the global companies of the new era, the, the e-companies, at the moment, if you, if you look at the top 100, about 85 are between the US and China. So these two very large markets dominate globally. India should be part of this. So why is it not part of this? One reason is that actually India operates as many different states. It doesn't operate as a single market for uh, services. And at least initially, you need this market before you go uh, uh, global. At least this is one of our... GST story. So the GST story may help. That's right. That's one of my uh, uh, hopes that that would uh, help. But, uh, and I'm, I'm nearly finished, the SMEs versus large companies. You know, the World Bank has been very big over the last two decades or so to say that it's SMEs that create jobs. That's factually true, but economically wrong in the sense that the reason that uh, SMEs create lots of jobs is that you don't have opportunities for large firms. If you had large firms, then you don't need to have this uh, small scale uh, uh, firms, which in most cases are survival. Basically, you don't have anything else to do, so establish your own business. But we have studies that we cite that basically says the average productivity in a given country, not across countries between small firms and large firms, is basically one to six or one to seven. So you should think about large firms. Yes, small firms are around, they're helpful in services sectors and contractors, but that's not what drives economic growth. And it's certainly not what drives exports. Going back to this idea of global India, if you want global India, you need large companies. SMEs are not really going to, um, uh, to do it. And I will finish here. Great. So, uh, you know, I think uh, this is a good... Um, Fantastic intervention from all of you. Thank you very much. And an ex excellent opening presentation. And then I think it was a marathon response session. You went through at least 20 uh, specific issues. Let me conclude with four thoughts. I never had the op opportunity to ask you a question, but I'm leaving some musings, short musings. The first, of course, is for Junaid as he works with governments. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bhalla is in the room, so I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm, I'm, with trepidation, I'm, I'm putting some numbers out there. I think there are 220 million teenagers or 230 million teenagers. Add another 150 or so between five and the teens, and maybe another 150 between the teens and say 26. Or I, I, you mentioned 29. So assuming India's median is 29 or thereabouts, we are looking at a substantial chunk. If we were to spend even a thousand dollars a year on these 700 million Indians, thousand uh, dollars a year to provide them some form of education skill. Relearning, learning, upgradation, average thousand dollar ticket size. We are talking about a seven hundred billion dollar enterprise. It's a seven hundred billion dollar effort. I think when the finance minister goes into the uh, uh, parliament to announce the budget, he takes five hundred billion dollars of uh, 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 in his briefcase. That's what he has uh, accounts for five hundred billion dollars. So I think we have to understand the uh, the the scale, and therefore I think this overemphasis on old form of education is perhaps foolhardy. And I disagree with it. I think you have reached the right conclusion that American narratives should not define our appreciation of the future of work. I think you should also start thinking about another new realization that solutions devised in, in Oxbridge and Harvard and Boston are not necessarily going to be the solutions for this world. So I think we have to be far more innovative 
when we think about what education means. I, 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 I am not trying to uh, deny the importance of education, but what that education for a, um, a smartphone enabled 10 year old means today is very different. I don't have to put them through the same kind of schooling, formal educations. So a smartphone and a 14 year old with competence to access knowledge is something that we need to now start thinking about. So access to information, access to knowledge, making the journals freely available, breaking down the American intellectual property and freedom of expression barriers, uh, and many of these new kind of ideas which will allow competence to flourish uh, digitally and technologically enabled so that I don't, I don't have $700 billion to spend 1,000 uh, per person. So I think we have to think about that. So I think that overemphasis on traditional responses to your new age realization is something that I was a little, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, worried about. The second was that uh, I think you, uh, Gautam raised this point and you mentioned it in your report. Most of the countries which are going to be impacted by your report now essentially are completing two big projects. One is the uh, the real infrastructure project where you're building your roads and ports and schools and hospitals and, and uh, railways and, and airports. And for that, you require a very different governance structure. Governments are powerful when they have to do that. They have to acquire land. They have to uh, uh, you know, uh, cre create tenders. They have to act like licensors. They are arbiters. They are, so they are a very different beast when they are conducting the 20th century operations of creating real infrastructure of providing uh, public goods and public services. And as soon as you move to the knowledge sector, the new sectors, governments have to move away. They have to disappear. They have to be very light government. You know, when you move into uh, the gig economy, the platform economy, when you need Alibaba's to flourish or the, 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 the Silicon Valley models to, uh, to be developed, governments have to recede and disappear. Now, most countries are not going to be able to do this. I think that's the second thing. The, the competing demands on, on governance postures within many of these new countries is going to be one of the biggest challenges for most of us. That how does the government get both of them right? How am I able to build that power plant and create a, a, my, my real infrastructure and yet be very light in my uh, presence when I have to allow the knowledge age to, um, to, to flourish? So I think that, that competing government along with the state capacity, I think are, are really important issues. And, and finally, I think, um, let me put forward two ideas. Again, I think you have moved halfway in accepting that the prognosis coming out of the Western literature is not always right. But I still think the solution is still dominated by the Western narrative. So what if I was to say that if we were, and this is Mr. Bhalla's point, that if we were to understand that we are at the cusp of something unique, you know, the platform economy that India has built, this public database, and I, I, I'm, I don't condone our regulators uh, uh, antics over the last three, four days. But I'm saying the, 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 the public database that we have built up allows India a great opportunity to actually embrace informality. I think informality has for long been treated as bad by traditional econ economists. So it is bad, so let's not be innovative in trying to find solutions within in informality. You have always been focused on removing informality. Now suppose your innovation was to be deployed in making informality work, would there be different outcomes? So I think one thing, embrace informality. And second, again, going back to the SME point and many other, embrace that small can be beautiful as well. I think that small is beautiful some, is something that works. And I think this over uh, obsession with scale and size, again, flows from an Atlantic experience. Can we make, can we create, and the platform economy allows you to do that. So someone who produces 50 leather bags instead of 5,000 is able to access the same markets because of these uh, 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 global marketers like Walmart and, and Alibaba and others. Alibaba is a classic case where you have mom and pop uh, production capabilities now being taken to global scale. So I think that small is beautiful can also work if we get it right. And I don't think uh, we need to dismiss that as something which is, again, a bad and a drain on growth and, and, and economic potential. But they're just thoughts. I, I mean, we, we haven't um, really thought about many of these in, in a focused manner, but I think India is doing that now. And thanks to Junaid and others who are encouraging many of us to spend many of our hours looking at these important questions of human capital and future of work. Uh, I think uh, in a few years, uh, India will have a story to tell. And I think uh, uh, either we succeed or we fail, it's helpful to the world. You know, we, they have an example to, uh, to either emulate or not to choose. So uh, thank you very much for joining us.